who are you and how would you describe your position or your role in the photographic industry? Hi, my name is Jess Hurd. I'm a photographer, sometimes call myself a journalist or press photographer, depending on what I'm covering at the time. Um, I'm campaigning photojournalist, so I work in the campaigning sector quite a bit and also campaign for photographer rights myself. Yeah, wow. So if you were a photographer beginning a career, how would you get into the photographic industry? I mean, how would you break into the room? It's interesting. I was on a job on, sun, on Saturday and a photographer asked me this and where best to study. And I said, well, I didn't actually study photography. I studied, I did a fine art degree with sociology and all the way through that course and beforehand when I was at Bourneville Art College, um, I was taking a lot of photographs and trying to get them into places, into uh, magazines and newspapers. And it, I just gravitated towards that medium rather than um, painting, which I originally started as. Uh, the idea really was that it was much more immediate and you could much easier connect with connect with people the issues you wanted to convey rather than go through the gallery structure so how did you make an impact as a photographer when you you didn't approach it as a photographer I, well no but i kind of um did begin to see that photography perhaps was the best way to communicate um the ideas that i was trying to focus on so um I think my advice would be just to get out there and shoot and try and make as many connections with organisations that you would like to work for and people that you'd like to work alongside with, places you'd like to go, you know, so when things came up um, internationally, I was like, I really want to go there, I really want to cover this event, who, do, who will enable me to do that, um, who can I contact uh, to try and make this happen, uh, and, and it tended to work. <laughs> Thankfully. You're fantastic at that, actually, Jess, because it always seems to me as an outsider that you're doing the kind of work you want to do. And that I guess that's because you do make hard approaches and powerful approaches to those kind of organisations and clients. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, um, I think it's about having a passion for what you do. So that drives you rather than the, the fear of rejection or whatever you're I really want to be here. Like, let's make this happen. Let's get the get the funding. Um, you know, some events I'd go and do a half a day here or there, a day here with different organisations, and that that is what um, that is what financed trips. Yeah, fantastic. So, okay then, how do you get paid for your work? So, when I was first starting out, I found it really difficult. You know, to the, the rates, um, there is uh, recommended rates uh, that the uh, National Union of Journalists have got, uh, which I recommend you go and have a look at for different jobs uh, across the sector, uh, whether it be PR or press, um, which is really, really useful because it means that you don't undersell yourself or um, uh, or do someone else out of, out of work, really. So never work for free um if you know you're worth hiring you're worth paying for um i think that's the mistake a lot of students and early entrants make you know that you've got to uh just get your pictures published and if you don't value your work no one else is going to yeah you've ticked me off a few times in the past simon get that invoice in <laughs> awesome so do you need a second job in order to make a living income you know um, I haven't. Um, I've been okay. Um, but I know some colleagues that do. Uh, if you want a press card, if you want to be associated with National Union Journalists, you have to have the majority of your income uh, uh, through journalism. So that's a consideration. Uh, obviously, people have got to survive and exist. Uh, there is like a temporary membership, which is like a bridge between one to the other which is quite useful for three years. Uh, but yeah, no, I haven't had to do that, thankfully. Brilliant. Okay, so 
Photography has changed immensely over the last period, especially since the development of digital technology and social media. Sound like a cliche now, right? We talk about post-digital, but it feels like the beginning still. But how do you sustain your position in this competitive environment? And additionally, do you see that, how do you see the future development of photography? Now, when I'm talking about competition, I'm talking about the incredible amount of work and material that is published every hour, which obviously is still rising. Yeah, I guess you have to always be uh, move with the times uh, and try and be at the front of that. I think when I, well, I was, uh, I set up a digital library. I think it was one of the first digital libraries at the um, left wing paper I started off at and was pretty much one of the first photographers I know to have a website um, you know, to promote the work, um, the issues that I cover, and I guess also me. Um, and yeah, social media wise, I think you have to keep up with that and you have to be able to far from the camera, you have to be live news now. And where it's going, uh, who knows? I mean, it's photography is more popular than ever. And I think the key to the key to being commissioned and the key to getting you your work used is that people have got to trust you and uh, rely that you are going to get the images that they need and um, so that's a lot of the discussing with the client beforehand making sure exactly what what they need is what you get um and yeah and speed and you know having always having a backup plan if <laughs> something goes wrong if you know a piece of tech fails you know you've got another backup handy because that inevitably happens you know but it's got to be pretty seamless for the client that things have gone out yeah 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 so you're about building that professional relationship with the client and giving what what they need quickly sure that that's got to be that's got to be the edge you know that people mm. trust you and like you and want to work with you not because like you say the the whole industry is saturated you know there's with photographers, images everywhere, you know, why would they pick, why would they pick you? Yeah. I was at the Palestine demo on the 15th of May. I think you covered it. I know you did. Um, Palestine solidarity campaign. There you are. But one thing I did notice, and of course it's, <clears throat> it's in our minds in the contemporary world, but one of the inspiring things about that, demo was the amount of young people there. I was taken aback by that personally because I see it as a bit of an old Duffers campaign or it has been. But having said that, everybody got a camera. And you just know that everybody's sharing. You know, it's fantastic in a lot of ways, but what I'm trying to get to is, do you feel threatened by the competition at all? Do you feel that pressure or do you feel secure? Not at all. I think, I think the democratization of the media is something to be welcomed that people can document their lives around them whether it be instances of police brutality or you know whatever it is um at, on the um covering the palestine protest when jeremy corbyn got up to speak like it was just a sea of, of cameras of phones and i thought that was that yeah. was great everyone wants it for themselves do you know what i mean with their own yeah. with their own camera with their own phone so like we recording our own history so it's yeah. fantastic it's fantastic yeah so okay um i think so I, I think the key point there though is if people uh if amateurs or you know semi-professionals do get their work used like often news outlets will say can i use your tweeted photo or whatever then they do need to charge for it because otherwise you're undermining industry for the people who are full time in it and that have invested and oh. and have to make earn a living, you know. So I think it's oh. it, it's good that we we push that out that people should you know have to pay for content. Yeah, yeah. No content, no interweb, right? Exactly. It's all about content, and we give it away. Content is value. So exactly. Um, so I would like to platform some of your work as a practicing practicing photographer. So I'm asking if you could briefly show or describe the strongest three images that you've taken during your career. And why did you choose these images? You know, did the audience and or the client like them? Did you get paid? 
or did you use them to make a platform to strengthen your career? Did they have an impact on your career? Three. <laughs> okay, that's difficult, but I think I've got three now. Um, so it's coming up for the 20th anniversary of, um, of uh, Genoa G8 Summit. Wow. And I took a, an image then of uh, a young lad, 21 years old, Carlo Giuliani, and he was shot in the head by the police and run over twice by a police uh, armoured vehicle uh, and, and killed. And I was there covering the G8. Um, I'd been at the kind of fluffy end of the protests and um, and gravitated out to get some lunch. And I followed helicopters and I stumbled upon this scene with the Carabinieri, the, the Italian riot police surrounding this semi-naked body, you know, caved in um, of this young lad. And they'd taken his scarf off and uh, revealed his face. So it's a picture I took with a long lens through the legs of a, a riot cop um, focusing on, on his his face and I took a wide picture as well and I was on my own they'd moved everyone else through and you know it's quite obviously intimidating with the police and this young lad who's clearly been killed I didn't know the circumstances at the time um, but just and I was shooting on negative then so I remember coming back and getting them processed and uh, my friend who processed them in, in the shop he was like he could have w warned me, you know what I mean? What, what is going, what is, what happened, you know? And just scanning those images in because it, it was a very tense, very tense protest indeed. And um, there was a whole strategy of tension, which the police built up around it, calling the protesters terrorists. This was um, Berlusconi at the time. Um, and this was like pre 9-11, just, just before in the summer before that. Um, and yeah, it was incredibly tense. And I just remember just breaking down at, you know, at the screen, just scanning these pictures in because just the, how horrific it was. And masses came onto the streets, um, across the country, uh, with massive banners, assassino, like the state of assassinated one of us. And it, it really fed a huge movement, um, in Italy. And for me, and the image um, was in the the Cobol Portrait Awards in um, in the, the National uh, Portrait Gallery and in other places, in other exhibitions too, and just trying to raise the, the profile and you know try and get justice. Um, and there were raids and people were beaten up and there's a lot of trauma from from that uh, from that event. So it's 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 carried with me in every year. You know the anniversary is, I re, you know, I remember it, and uh, my friends and colleagues also do, and especially ones in from Italy. Uh, so I guess that's the first one. Um, second one, which meant um, a lot to me, uh, was when I went over to Haiti um, after the earthquake. In the, I mean, after the earthquake, there were still aftershocks, but after the huge earthquake. Um, and I was photographing, actually there was a few photographers photographing the same scene and it's um, uh, basically uh, people going into a burning building because basically it was devastated. Haiti was flattened, you know, people were flattened under it uh, because there was no investment in the infrastructure unlike other places like Chile, which had a, an earthquake of a similar magnitude afterwards, which didn't have anywhere near the level of uh, devastation and the history of slavery and colonialism is all part of it and I really wanted to get over there and to expose the situation and so like I traveled in with um, some uh, Haitians from from the states and stayed with them and they came out with me and um, helped me edit said you must take this picture and it was kind of a collective thing it was really Im impacting and this scene of uh, these people, it's just quite apocalyptic, you know, you've got smoke coming up, um, uh, you've got fire, uh, this guy's uh, coming out with a bag of flour, and I filed my pictures um, uh, saying, you know, uh, people, something like people salvaging uh, for survival out of the wreckage, and 
other people or the desks uh, filed it with the um, caption, you know, mass looting. And I was just, and uh, a friend of mine contacted me and was like, I can't believe the captions on whatever news platform it was. And anyway, it became a, a big issue as to the, uh, basically the, the racist interpretation of what was going on. And uh, as soon as I came back, I went straight into uh, the BBC and, and did an interview about, about that very image. And actually the same day we'd organized a mass uh, gathering of photographers for photographer rights in Trafalgar Square. So I went straight yeah, yeah. from, so straight from the airport to the BBC and then straight to this um, process of thousands of photographers. It was a quite a quite a crazy thing. Um, but just the importance of, of you know, if not only the images, but the, the captions as well, it's so important. And that's why I, you know, file images through an independent agency, which, you know, uh, guarantees that people use the correct captions, you know, that it's part of the, um, terms and conditions. So uh, yeah, I think I, right. it, it really means a lot to me that my images aren't misused and I've um, uh, engaged the National Union of Journalists when, when they've been misused uh, to, to get Respect people to for that, by the way. Respect for that. It's part of the job. <laughs> it's part of the job. So um, number three. So the third... Um, was an image I took, a set of images at Dale Farm, mm. which is a, a traveller site in Basildon, um, in Essex. And I was uh, invited in uh, to take pictures uh, in the run up to an eviction. So maybe for three years, I covered different events like um, uh, social events, um, family weddings and so on. And there was, uh, four weddings in the run up to the eviction that all happened in a short space of time. And I uh, was invited to take pictures there as press. And and that was quite quite something. I mean, I don't really like weddings, but travel to weddings are, are brilliant <laughs> and so much fun. And people make a real effort, you know, and everyone's all dressed up and, and, uh, and so on. And I'd take, taken a set of pictures that the, um, the Guardian used actually on the eyewitness um, a set of four images. But before um, before that, I went out because the story uh, they get a lot of discrimination, as you might imagine. There's a lot of racism, and events venues will call the police before anything even happens, just that they find out that it's a it's a traveller event. And anyway, the police came. And I, uh, I was actually shooting video and stills then. And uh, I, I took some pictures of the police in the car park and like hand over uh, with the video. And basically they stopped me and uh, their terrorism powers. And I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm recording all this. They, you know, I'm covering a, a wedding. I'm photographing a wedding, seriously. You're stopping me under section 44 of the terrorism act which turned out to be actually they stopped me under section 43 which is a lot worse um and so that led to another crazy set of events but the the guardian um yeah crafted all this into uh into one piece um that it was actually un human rights day and <laughs> and yeah and, and this was happening and the problem with that it was great because it, you know, raised um, the profile of the campaign and, and everything and more acceptance of tra travellers. But also um, I got a number of calls uh, from editors wanting contact details because they wanted to go the TV route and uh, which I didn't give. Um, and out of that came the Big Fat Gypsy Wedding, which I think was an appalling, an appalling uh, and but you know the but the actual the campaigning and the eventual um, resisting against the eviction was 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 really impressive. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know what to say about all that because you know I've been I've been following you for I don't know twenty years, 
must be 15, 20 years. And, you know, as a production manager, I always see you on the events that I'm working on or, you know, all that stuff. But I know that, you know, you're always in the front line. You're always in the interesting places and the difficult places. You know, you, you said about Genoa, I remember Genoa. Um, you know, after Seattle, that got scary. And didn't the police raid the kind of, the, there was like a press hostel and they went in with the batons and stuff. And oh, yeah. mate. Well, you're always around those environments. Massive respect. So if you had a few sentences to give to a student who was entering the photography workplace, what would be your sage advice? I guess try and work in a sector that you have a passion for, you know, because actually time goes very quickly as well. <laughs> so, you know, you need to, you need to really pursue what you want. I wouldn't start anywhere just, for the money you've got to really try and pursue what you what you want to cover and what you'll get a name for um and cover the stories that you want and it builds up a body of body of work um that then becomes impressive you know and you can i guess it, it's difficult you know and sometimes yeah i guess you'd have to run parallel jobs to start off with maybe for to get your money but i'd try and stick to what you what what you want to do otherwise you just get like pushed into a different area be yourself cool be yourself be true to yourself and and don't you know compromise on that i think all four of my interviewees have said the similar thing you must stand as yourself and what you believe in um brilliant so okay i guess that ends the four more questions now your turn i've got one last question which is is there anything you want to say? Open mic, anything you want to say? Um, just that I'm excited for the future. You know, I mean, it's been a tough old year, lockdown wise, you know, the whole feeling redundant, even though you can go out and take photos. I didn't want to replicate the what was being done by my colleagues, COVID wise, particularly. I stayed in East London trying to cover positive stories and get some positive outputs um, of, the, of the of what people were doing. Um, yeah, um, I'm just, yeah, I'm just quite excited uh, to be back, back working. And um, I hope to see my new colleagues, the, the new fresh students out on the street. <laughs> okay, Jess, thank you. Um, you know, I wanna say thank you formally for your time and for sharing your experiences with us. And I hope some students watching this will be inspired to go and look at your work because we haven't even touched it. Um, so keep going. We're all behind you. Thank you.